Oh, last thing, Thurston, can you hear me? Would, would you mind bringing down the video cable for my green bag or sending Tim down with it, maybe? Hi, Wise. Sorry. No, that's fine. That's fine. Do you want to come and have a chat to me today and just let me know how everything's going in the gap? Yeah. Um, oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Guys, oh. come in and oh, again every week. Okay. <laughs> Hello, everyone. How did the Eng 1000 uh, sumo uh, thing go? Interesting. Was it good? Yeah. Yes. Did it? Did people enjoy it? Yeah. And did you get a sense of achievement? Yeah. Well done. Cool. Um, I didn't get to see it, but uh, I've heard there's a buzz going around an email that there are videos of it that people have already been seeing, possibly even already on YouTube. Is that right? Yeah. So I've just got to find those and see them, but apparently they're awesome. So well done to everyone who did the sumo robot. <laughs> this is in a course called Eng 1000. Now you're not necessarily all doing Eng 1000. Let me just tell you something about it briefly so you might contemplate doing it in a future session if you're not doing it now. Eng 1000 is a group work project where people work in small groups to do interesting things. Now, the main thing about Eng 1000 is the group work. The fact that as a team you pull off awesome things. So the computing students doing Eng 1000 at the moment are making little sumo robots to fight each other, uh, to push each other out of a ring. Is that right? Two robots, it's a competitive thing? And then now you're going to do a, a maze navigator to, you sort of, we're building up to the rescue thing. Because as you m might or might not already know, one of the really interesting uses of robots is in rescue missions. So where uh, there are hazardous situations where it's too dangerous to send a person in, we can send a robot in. So for example, um, buildings that have half collapsed or, or fires or dangerous situations or defusing bombs or crash sites or anything like that where we don't necessarily want to send a person in but there could be people in there that need to be rescued we'd really like to be able to send robots in and rescue them there's a whole lot of interest in this around the world at the moment and UNSW is one of the leaders in developing robots for rescuing people so um, so well done everyone who's doing that now uh, just to get the course in context we're now about halfway through the course um, which is uh, an exciting point in the rest of your life, things might be getting busy because uni as, as, as normally goes, as the session goes on, gets busier and busier and busier and busier. You've probably noticed if we've done it right in computing, we've worked you hard from the beginning. We have a reason for that, which is towards the end then, we don't have to suddenly ramp up and there's not an explosion of work for you, hopefully. And when all the other subjects go crazy, hopefully you've already got the computing and you've already learnt it. Now, um, we're going to do something... Uh, unusual this year uh, and it's an idea that um, I've stolen from someone in Hong Kong, a brilliant teacher I saw in Hong Kong. Uh, his idea was, he also uses wiki, so that's why we were chatting. And I was saying, yeah, I get the students to write the notes on the wiki and it's really good and da 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 And he said, oh, we do the same thing. They write the notes and we call it the textbook. And I said, yeah, that's right. It's a, it is sort of the textbook, isn't it, the wiki? And he said, and then you know what we do? And I said, what? And he said, we print the textbook out and we bind it and we give it to them. And they can take it into the exam. And I said, 
oh, what an awesome idea. So I got an email from the exam person yesterday who was saying, all right, I've given them some special requests for the exams and I'm, you know, you're not supposed to fool around with exams. And the guy wrote back to me saying, okay, look, all right, we're complying with these special requests, but just to make sure we're on the same page, no more special requests, you're going to comply with everything that you've done and everything and everything and everything's going to be exactly the same. And I said, thank you so much. That's really cool of you. Um, <laughs> I have one more special request. <laughs> and I put it in and he said, yes, we can do it. In fact, he thought it was a great idea too. So what we're going to do is, if I manage to pull it off, about towards the end of week 12, I'm going to pull out all the nice notes. So you're write, writing the nice notes. If it's too long, we'll have to edit it down. I might get some art students to do that, or maybe you guys can do that. And we'll have some sort of page limit. And then whatever you've got as your nice notes, I'll print off, I'll hopefully bind, and I'll hand it to you as you're going into the exam. And then you can have that as an exam study in the exam. So awesome idea, don't you think? So you don't have to memorize anything at all. And an even better incentive for you to make sure that the nice notes are good. Now at the moment, I haven't done any of the nice notes marking. I've just kept an eye on who's, who's been contributing and who hasn't. <laughs> at some point when things calm down a bit for me and all the assignments that are happening and everything that's happening, I'm going to go through and start marking the nice notes. In fact, maybe I'll get the tutors to mark the nice notes for their own tutor. Maybe. No, said the tutors. They, they know that they know more. Is that what you're saying? You know you'd be good at doing that. Okay, excellent, cool. Uh, so, uh, so we will be doing that, but now not only is there a mark involved in doing the proper thing when you write the nice notes up, there's this incentive that, oh, well, in fact, the mark doesn't go for the nice notes, does it? It goes for the raw notes. There's now an incentive to get the nice notes looking nice because that'll be your uh, thing you carry away from the course. It'll be a nice little bound book of all the things we've done. All right, now, in the lecture on Monday, I did a sort of risky thing. I was a bit nervous about it. I don't think I quite pulled it off, but I think we got close, which was I wanted to show you how quickly we could solve the problem of writing a Sudoku solver. And the reason for that is uh, over last year sometime, uh, I was getting annoyed with a Sudoku puzzle, and I was so annoyed I thought, I'm going to write a program to solve this. And I thought, gee, I wonder how long it'll take to write. And so I thought about it carefully. And I thought of all the fancy things I could do and I thought, well, no, I'm just going to make a, a good data structure to represent a Sudoku board and we'll see where that takes us. And I was astonished that in under an hour I had a Sudoku solver that was lightning fast. And I thought, wow, I could almost do that live in a lecture in under an hour. And what a great way of convincing people that data structures are really the thing to look at first. It's a really appropriate thing to look at. So I jotted down a few notes for how I did it and I tried to do it in the lecture the other day. Uh, I wish I hadn't jotted down the notes. I think I should have either exactly gone through my exact notes or completely written it from scratch because I was sort of half writing and half looking at the notes and I got all t terribly confused. And at the end, we actually had a code that worked, but um, I didn't manage to compile it properly. So we left the lecture not on the high note that I wanted, although we ended up getting the correct code, we ended it on a slightly confused note. So I thought I'd start today by looking at the code we wrote yesterday and just describing it just to make sure you understand the, um, the algorithm we came up with. So here's the code. It's, it's on the lecture notes. Let's look at it here. All right, now I think the key thing about the code is, well, key things are, one, we have a function which is going to solve a Sudoku game, and it's also going to return a value saying whether or not it solved it. So this function is doing two things. Yes, Luke. Oh, I just misspelt it. Uh, and uh, can we change that? No, no, no. I like it being misspelled. It's sort of cute. Uh, I'd be happy to change it, except shh, shh, shh. a couple of people have already finished the assignment. If you're already, if you're a, um, if you, I was been watching their diaries over the over last night, and it was really fun to watch them do it. Uh, if you're a good programmer and you can already program, this assignment should take you no more than a day or two to knock over. It's actually easier than the first assignment. If you haven't programmed before. It'll take you a couple of days to work out what the heck we're actually asking you to do. But once you've worked out what you need to do, you'll be astonished because it's so easy and you should knock it over in a few more days. So everyone should comfortably be able to have it all finished by the end of the weekend. It's actually a small assignment, which is what's so neat because it's solving a non-trivial problem. Uh, so, so some people have already finished it with that spelling, so I can't really change the name in the middle. I wish I'd spelt it correctly, but you know, welcome to my world. Nothing's ever spelt correctly. At least I spelt, misspelt it consistently. Now that someone's told me the correct spelling, I'm in trouble because I know half the time I'll spell it one way and half the other. But anyway, okay. Shh, 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 shh. At least I pronounce it correctly. So, shh, 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 shh. let me just regain my thoughts. Okay, so key things. One is 
We want a function to solve it and we're also going to need to know whether a solution is possible. Key thing number one to realize is it's more or less the same job to do both of those tasks so we probably just want one function to do it and to return both of those pieces of information. We return whether or not it worked as a boolean, we return that by the return value and how do we return the corrected, the, the filled in so solved game? How is that sol returned to the user? We write it to the array. The Sudoku grid itself gets modified. So the parameter that gets passed in, Sudoku grid, is actually modified by the function, which as you know is a side effect which you normally don't like doing. Okay, um, that's thing number one. Interesting thing number two is we wanted to actually come up with a type that represented a Sudoku grid. So when we were thinking about how to solve it, we could solve it in a high level way. We didn't want to be solving it thinking of arrays and ints and chars. We wanted to be solving it using in our mind the same language we use when we think about Sudoku. So we wanted to have a Sudoku grid. We wanted to have cells and we wanted to have values. So we typed deft everything up the front. So now when we think about the problem and talk about the problem ourselves, hey guys up there, shh, 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 shh. Um, When we think about the problem and talk about it ourselves, the words we use are exactly the words that are in the program. So we created a type called Sudoku grid, which was an array of values. And we said a value was a char, though it doesn't have to be, of course, it could be whatever we wanted. And uh, it's made of 81 cells, and a cell is the location of, of one of those little cells. So that's a number between 0 and 80. That's what a cell is. And the value is what we stick in there. So that's obviously a number between 1 and 9, with a dot, meaning um, it's empty. OK, so uh, interesting thing number one, not clever thing. Interesting thing number one is um, to realize we need to do two things at once. We might as well do them. Interesting thing number two. Might as well do them in the one function. Interesting thing number two was to type def everything, which is in sudoku grid.h. Where's sudoku grid.h? That's in the assignment spec, isn't it? So let's go to the assignment. Schedule. Uh, sudoku grid.h. Is that big enough for the people at the back? Can you read that? No, let's make it bigger. Okay, so we type def cell, shh, 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 shh. we type def value. Do you want us to kill those lights? They're a bit of a pain, aren't they? And we type def Sudoku grid itself to be an array of size 81. Okay, now, now that we've done those things, interesting thing number three about the problem was to realize it has a sort of a recursive structure. And a recursive structure to a problem simply means that the solution to the problem is somehow related to the solution to a simpler problem. That's the recursion. The, 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 the fact that noting that solving the problem sort of involves solving the problem. Like factorial 6, oh, I can get that from factorial 5. Sudoku solution for a whole grid, hey, I can get that from a Sudoku solution to a part of a grid. So the relationship we noticed, in fact, was the given a partially filled in grid, to get the solution, all we had to do was fill in one more cell, and that gave us a new partially filled in grid, and we could solve that. Does that make sense? So what we did was, we said, give me a partially filled in grid. Stick a random value somewhere, I don't care where. And now try and solve that new cell. And that's a recursive call. If there's no solution to this new grid, then either we've stuck the wrong value in that cell, or there's no solution overall. So let's try another value in that cell, and another, and another. And we try one after another, all the nine possible legal values in that cell. And each time we then say, and Sudoku grid, try and solve the whole thing now, with this new, even more filled in cell. If after all those nine attempts, we weren't able to solve it with any of the values in that cell, what does that tell us? There is no solution at all, and we return fail, no solution. Okay, does that make sense? That was the brains behind our whole solution. Here's what it looks like. Let's go over the code. If it's already full, all recursive solutions need to have the terminal case, like factorial of 0 is 1. So we can stop getting smaller and smaller. So if it's already full, then woohoo, we're in. We'll just say it's solved. If it's not already full, this is all this stuff down here. If it's not already full, then get a random cell, which we'll call get free cell. I don't care which cell you return. You could give me the first available cell or the last available cell, whichever one. Just give me a cell that doesn't have anything in it. Pick a trial value to stick in that cell. That's min value. Let's say we haven't yet solved it. 
And now keep repeating until we solve it or until we run out of values to stick in the cell. The first case will be we've solved it and we can abort saying true. And the last one, if that's never, if that never, if we eventually fill up all the values and try all possible values and still haven't solved it, that means we can abort and say false. Yeah, there is no solution. So we say uh, we've got a trial value we're going to stick in. First of all, let's see if it's legal to stick it in. If it's not legal to stick it in, there's no point in sticking it in there. Is legal, if you look at the spec, is defined. Some people have been confused about what is legal means. Um, one thing about computing is the spec is king. That means whatever the specification says goes. So when I say in the assignment, this function returns one if it's legal and zero if it's not legal, you can't sit down and think, oh, I bet I know what the word legal means and use an everyday meaning of the word legal or invent your own meaning of the word legal. You have to go to the spec and say, well, what does the spec say legal means? And you'll notice in the introductory paragraph, legal is defined. So that's the definition of legal you have to use. And I've seen posts on the forums with people saying, oh, I want my legal to mean this, and I want my legal to mean that. You can want it to mean whatever you want, that's fine, but whatever the spec says is all that counts. So if it's a legal one to stick in, which means if it doesn't clash with any other number already in there in the same row, and it doesn't clash with any number already in there in the same column, and it doesn't clash with any number already in its same cell, we regard that as a legal move, yes? Um, with the get free cell thing. Yes. Yes. Doesn't that mean that if you're going to use someone else's testing process yes. on another person's program, yes. if they use a different... Oh, oh yeah. Can, look, can you hold up? What's your name? Joel. Joel. Oh, you're Joel. Okay. Sorry, Joel. I didn't recognise you. Because last time you had sunglasses on, maybe, or something. No, I had a yellow hat. You had a yellow hat. Yeah. <laughs> now, this time your hat has sunglasses. That's the confusing thing. Can you ask me that question later on? Don't let it slip by today. When we get up to unit testing, that's a really good question to ask. Um, so, if it is legal to stick it in, then let's stick it in. So we've stuck in our trial value. We've said, I've got a random square, I've stuck a 1 in it. And then we say, with this new improved game now, which is slightly more filled in, does it have a solution? If it does have a solution, this will be true. And lo and behold, remember there's a side effect, game will now be converted to contain the correct solution. Remember that's what is solution, has solution does? It does two things. One is it updates game to contain the solution. The other thing is it tells us whether there is a solution or not. So at this point, if, it, if this is true, then we'll know that there is a solution and also game will contain that solution and we can just terminate. So we say solved equals true, which will abort us out of the while loop here and, and we return solved, which is we return true because there is a true. That's the easy part. But what if it turns out we've stuck a trial value in We've asked Sudoku Solver now to solve this new grid and it hasn't been able to find a solution. It doesn't necessarily mean we can give up. Maybe we just stuck the wrong value in. So we're going to clear that value out that we just wrote in. We wrote in a 1 before. We're going to erase it out now. And then we're going to increase our trial value by 1. So our trial value will now be 2. And then we jump back out to the top. And we think, all right, can I stick a 2 in there? Is it legal to stick a 2 in? And if it's legal to stick a 2 in, I will. And if it's not, then we won't. And in either case, if it was legal or not, if there was no solution, we'll try then next three, and then four, and then five, and then six. And we'll keep inside this loop, and we'll abort out of this loop if either we've eventually managed to solve it, or if there's no solution. And we will return here saying either yes or no, there is a solution or no solution. This recursive code solves the whole thing. Now, Luke, question. Two things. Um, shh, 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 shh. With the um, exclamation mark solved, yes. um, because you define zero and one, what does that exactly mean? Oh yeah, uh, exclamation mark means not. So solved. Yeah. So uh, so let me sort of answer this question in a slightly roundabout way. The word solved is a variable. It contains what? True or false? Yes, that's what it contains. True or false? It's not a question. That's the same. Sounds like a question. So solved will contain true or false. Solved is actually what we call a predicate. Solved is something in English that is either true or false. So let me give you a predicate. This is a piece of chalk. <laughs> Regardless of whether it's true or false, it is true or false. So this is a piece of chalk is a predicate. The Sudoku problem has been solved. 
which I abbreviate to solved. That's either true or false. This is a stupid projector which is always in the way and I can't get rid of it and I wish I had a pair of wire cutters so I could free it from its chain and set it free into the wild. <laughs> now that is either true or false, so that's a predicate. You, you label the names you give to your variables that store trues or falses should be predicates so it, the program reads right. So you'd never have a predicate called flag. Yeah, that's not a variable, that's not a predicate. If your flag is telling you whether you're finished or not, what would you call the predicate? What would you call the variable? Finished, or has finished, if you wanted to be more verbose. Or it has finished. I'd prefer finished, because I don't think those other words add anything. But you could put the long other words in. But it's got to be something that's a predicate or not. So when you read your program, it makes sense. Now the, the operator bang, exclamation mark, shriek, is pronounced not in C. So reading this, as a C programmer, I read while not solved. Do you see? If you pick good variable names, your program reads like it makes sense. Now, what is the actual value going to be inside solved? It will not be 0 or 1. It will be true or false. Where false is, we happen to know, 0. But true is whatever we want as long as it's not zero. So not true will always be zero, but not false could be whatever number. I have no idea. Yes? How, isn't uh, assuming that false is zero, yes. uh, but not explicitly uh, dealing with that in your code, not the, you use the operator not in the assumption that false is zero. Yes. If it wasn't, it wouldn't work. Yes. So... That's sort of how not is defined in C. It, what's that? Say that again. Why not include stood bool and you get the... Oh, why not include stood bool and get true and false? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I just wanted people to see what's going on. Solve is not equal to zero. What's that? Wouldn't you just do solved is not equal to zero? To false. Solved, solved is not equal to zero? Solved is not equal to false. Solved is not equal to false. No, 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 no. Solved is not equal to false is equivalent to saying not solved. Logically, they mean the same thing. But semantically, I mean, when you, well, first of all, when you say them, it's just clutter. But also, what you're doing is you're comparing things with true and false is a very dangerous thing to do. Like if I said, uh, the, uh, the world is a wonderful place. The world is a wonderful place. Uh, let's suppose we think that's true. That's sentence number one. Here's sentence number two. The claim that the world is a wonderful place is true. Here's my assertion number one. I assert that the world is a wonderful place. If that predicate is true, I'll be correct. If that predicate is false, I'll be wrong. My assertion will be wrong. If I say, hey, the claim that the world is a wonderful place is true. Oh, that should be called two. <laughs> then claim number two will be true when the world is a wonderful place. And claim number two will be false when the world is not a wonderful place. Claim number two and claim number one are exactly, extensionally equivalent. From the outside, given the same input values, I return the same output values. But this is more complicated. Let me, if I was just going to be completely obsessive about it, what should I have said? Yes. The claim that, the claim that the world is a wonderful place is true, is true. Yes, now let me, let me make this really clear. Can everyone see that? I'll make it actually visible with light. But can everyone see it? and understand it with their minds, as well as their eyes. The claim that the claim that the world is a wonderful place is true, is true. I don't think I should stop there. I don't think it's clear enough what I mean. I should really say, the claim that the claim that the claim that the claim, <laughs> yeah, yeah. All of these things are the same. Which has the greatest clarity? The first one. So which should we put in our program? The first one. Extensionally, they're all the same. Two, <laughs> oh, no. 
Two has the second side effect. Two, so one is saying, one is saying, if solve. That's one. Two is saying, if solved equals true. Three is saying, if solve equals true equals true. All of these will be true and false at precisely the same time. This is simplest, one, but two, this is more dangerous. This contains two possible errors you could make. And complexity is like putting corners in a kitchen. If anyone's ever built a kitchen, if you put the more corners and nooks and crannies you put in the kitchen, the more places the food scraps can go where you can't see them. And the more places the cockroaches can live and breed and disgusting things can happen. So the best kitchens are just like white and smooth with curvy bits everywhere and no corners. Yeah, yeah, every, it's like inside a sphere. That would be the perfect kitchen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, if you look at modern microwaves, often inside them, they're very spherical inside rather than being all angled and cornery to make them easier to clean. We don't want to put little complicated corners in our programs because bugs will accrete there and mistakes and horrible things. So we want to make it simple so that it, you can see that everything's correct. So two possible bugs that could live here. What are the two bugs? Someone had their hand up. What are the two mistakes we could make? Yes. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, uh, yes. OK. Solved equals true is dangerous. What have we hashed to find true to be? One. If solve was equal to seven, would solve be true? No. Technically, solved is true if it's equal to seven. Is this expression true if solved is equal to seven? No. Very dangerous. Can you see that? This would cause all sorts of diabolical problems. Second, far simpler um, mistake you could make would just be to simply forget to put in both equals. You could do that. It's just asking to be done. I'm sure everyone does. Didn't you just want me to rub that out straight away? That's what you naturally want. So this, oh, danger, 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 Will Robinson. So we could do that, but let's not do it. Yes, you want to ask another question? If I was very sneaky and I came in hash to find false to, say, three instead of zero, your program wouldn't work anymore. Oh yeah, if you hash to find false to be three instead of zero, it wouldn't work. That's right. What's that? Well, you've already hashed to find false in the head of file anyway. But the whole point I don't get I, I don't get the question. Just give us quiet just so I can get the question. Shh, 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 shh. Quiet, quiet. point of, of, of defining things at the top is to hide implementation details, right? So you don't, so you can change them and your program will still work. Oh, there are various reasons for hash defining things. One of them is so we have flexibility, so we can change things and things will still work. But it doesn't work for false. No, that's right. No, no. But there are a range of reasons we hash define things. In fact, didn't we just, someone just asked this question on the forum? Now, let me just say, you should all go and look at a post I put on the forum because someone just asked this question. There are several reasons you hash to find things, and we did go over them in lectures. Number one is it makes your code more portable. You can change the hash defines and everything will still work. Reason number two is it makes things consistent, so you use the same values everywhere. Reason number three is it gives things names, so it gives them semantic meaning. So instead of seeing the number one, you see the word true, it makes sense. There's a whole range of reasons that make hash defines a good thing to do. Not all of them always apply. So in this case, yeah, you wouldn't expect your code to still work if false was hash defined to be three, because in C, the, like you're sort of going against the standard in C. In C, we mean false to be zero. So, you know, ifs wouldn't work and, you know, just, so you could do things like that. Yeah, yeah. Your programs can't be made so that if you change everything, everything will still work. But yes, they should be made so you can change as many things as possible and they'll still work. Absolutely. Yes. 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 Okay, let's look at that. Uh, let me just check before I look at that. That's a new question and that's a good question. Let me just check because we've had a couple of diversions. I just want to check. Did I finish what I was talking about before? I was trying to explain how this code worked to solve a Sudoku game. Does everyone know or feel confident enough now they could share it for a while and eventually work it out how a Sudoku sol this Sudoku solver works? 
or there are people that still have questions that they would like to ask about how the Sudoku solver works? Yes? I don't want to ask how it works, but like, is it possible that he won't be able to solve it at all? Good question. Is it possible it won't be able to solve it at all? Yes. yes. If there is no solution, it will not be able to find one. But if there is a solution, it will find one. Right, but is it, so what if it doesn't find a solution? If it doesn't find a solution, it means the person that put the puzzle in the newspaper is an evil person. <laughs> like, for example, uh, I, I could give you one, uh, you know, find a, a, a solution to solve this one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, three. <laughs> now, there's no way you can fill that in to make that work. Because it's, it's got two threes in the same column straight away. And I could make it more subtle than that. You know, I could set it up so that. Um, I could, yeah, I could look, I could, uh, yeah, I could put a, a nine over here. So I'd leave a hole there, but the nine's over here. So that knocks out any nines in this row. So, and you could be even more diabolical going back further and further. So yeah, sure. Of all the ways of arranging numbers into a Sudoku grid, how many ways are there of arranging numbers into a grid? Well, how many cells are there in the grid? 81. How many values can you put in the first cell? Nine. How many values can you put in the second cell? Nine. How many values can you put in the third cell? Nine. So there's shh, shh, nine to the 81. That's a very big number. That's how many possible Sudoku grids there are. Now, using common sense, you can reduce that a bit. You can say, oh, well, once I know there's nine in the first, there's only eight that can go in the second. And you can do little things like that to reduce it. But the total number of games, shh, 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 if we're being the most naive we want to be, is nine to the 81. That number is so big. How big is nine to the 81? Is that bigger than the number of ants on the bus? Bigger than the number of potatoes that would fit in my office? <laughs> that number is so big that were you to ever have to write a computer program to try every one of those combinations and see if it worked, how long will it take to run? Longer than your lifetime. Longer than your lifetime, I'll say. How many operations can your computer do a second? Shh, shh, a billion, say. Suppose your computer can do a billion operations a second. Suppose in just one machine code operation, you can check an entire Sudoku grid. Obviously, it's going to take much more than one operation. Suppose you can do it in just one. Well, then, uh, uh, then it's 9 to the 81 um, divided by 10 to the 9. 10 to the 9 is about, what, 9 to the 10? It's about the same, isn't it? So that's, that leaves us 9 to the 71. No, everyone knows these operations commute. Nine, um, that gives us nine, approximately 9 to the 71 seconds to solve it. Now, how many, how many seconds is 9 to the 71? Well, what's the lifetime of the universe? Um, I, I, yeah, <laughs> I have a funny feeling that something like in 10 to the 50, something like that, seconds, in 10 to the 50 seconds, all matter will have decayed into electrons or protons or something, you know, and the universe will just be a thin grey gas. So, so that's from now. And at that time, we're not even halfway there. We've barely passed the square root of this number. So if that happened, we went, wait, turned to the, waited until the universe turned into a grey gas, and then the universe started up and we waited until it fell into grey gas again. And it started up and we waited until it turned up into grey gas again. And the universe ran a billion times, starting up and finishing a billion times. That would take us up to 10 to the 59. <laughs> okay, so, you know, there's no way you can brute force this. A brute force search means you go through and by brute force you consider every combination. A brute force search will not solve this. What we want to do is a more clever sort of brute force search. And that's what this one does. This is, the one we've written is called a backtracker. The, shh, shh. What makes the backtracker faster than this, in fact, the backtracker solves it in under a second, shh, shh, is this step here. Can you see which it is? Bum, ba, bum, ba, bum. Oh, yeah, the is legal thing helps us a bit. 
what happens here is as we're going, if we find a partially filled in board that has no solution, we terminate now while it's still only partially filled in and we jump back. That's called backtracking. Once you find that there's a particular box that you can't put any value in, you don't try any other combinations in any of the other open boxes. You go back a step and say, oh, maybe I better try two in that box instead. That backtracking saves us considering most of the combinations. In fact, the number of combinations we consider is just a squillionth of this huge number. Yeah, it's like, it's got to be like a billion or something things we try. It's just nothing compared to this. It's nothing. It, it literally is nothing. You could get how many operations we do and you could repeat it over and over again and the universe could run as many times as there are ants on the bus. <laughs> could fit into that bus and you still wouldn't have reached the same number. Yes? Sudoku's could have a multiple solution, sure. The, empty, the completely empty one has heaps and heaps of solutions. If you wanted to find every solution, it'll take you a bit longer. Um, I, it might take you a long time to print them out, but if we ignore printing out time, it shouldn't take you too much longer, depending on how many there are. Yeah, you'd have to adjust the main calling program to not give up as soon as you find the first solution. Um, uh, how, to find all solutions is always a much harder problem than to find one. Harder, it takes much more time, it's a more complex thing, time complex thing. Um, uh, yeah, I look, the sheer number of solutions, I don't know how much this constrains the board, the sheer number of solutions might be that just actually grunting through them all takes too long. So yeah, it might not even be possible to, to count the number of correct solutions. But it would be easy for you to try. Once you've written your Sudoku solver, in that main loop you've got there, when it's finished, don't terminate, jump back and try the next value. And increase the counter by one. And when it finally finishes, print out that counter and that'll tell you how many legal solutions there are. Now quite possibly, eh, hey, here I haven't given it enough thought, quite possibly the universe is going to run down before you get that number, or quite possibly in 10 seconds time it's going to say, oh, there's a thousand solutions. But now I think about it, how many different Sudokus are there? There's got to be more than a thousand of them. There's, there's got to be lots of them. There's books of a thousand of them, so yeah, yeah. yeah. So maybe it'll last forever, maybe it'll, maybe it'll take a while. You find out. Print out updates as the number goes. Every thousand print out. I'm up to 6,000 now, I'm up to 7,000 now. And just set it running during the course and we'll get a rough idea. Yeah. Yes? Uh, we're not allowed to modify the actual main code. No, no, no. That's a good question. Let me say, in the extension lecture, lecture four today, all I'm going to do is just answer questions about the assignment. So if you completely understand the assignment, you don't have to come. And if you want to ask questions about it, like that excellent question you just asked then, who was it? Wave at me. Yeah. Can you guys modify the main function? The answer is no, you can't. You just have to implement the small bits. Okay. Shh, 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 shh. Now, I am getting slightly nervous because we're three quarters of the way through the lecture, yet we're only one quarter through the ways of the things I optimistically wanted to talk about. Hmm. This is what we've done. Here are the four big topics. We did this one. We've got this one. We've got this one. We've got this one. Oh, I said that one. <laughs> okay. Let me do this one quickly. Uh, maybe do this one quickly, then we'll take a break. Then I'll talk about this one. And then we'll take an, and then I'll, then I'll talk about these two, stealing a little bit of time for the extension lecture, but no one's going to ask any questions. Everyone, whenever I say, does that make sense? What are you going to say? Yes, yes, yes hurry up. <laughs> Just lie like that. That would be really cool for me. Uh, and then we'll take a break and then I'll do the assignment. All right, so let me just talk about this bit here now. And we have really only 10 minutes to do it, and I'll make sure that's all we take. All right. Do you remember we were talking about what actually happens when a function is called? What actually happens at the machine code level? And we discovered that because a function wants all of its data to be private, it stores all the data where? In a frame. And I have said in the past that on a lot of modern architectures, particularly lots of the Intel um, sort of uh, operating systems and setups and things you see. Uh, often the uh, source code for the function is written up the top and the frame lives somewhere down the bottom of memory. I haven't said why, I've just said that's sort of what happens. 
And if you had two different functions, what I've said so far is we'll have two different frames. Now, I'm now going to reveal to you there's a problem with the way that I've set up frames and we've looked at frames. And the problem is recursion. If a function can call itself, the first time it's called, it uses the frame and sticks all the value in. But what happens when the function calls itself? Where does it stick the data? It needs another frame. It can't use the same frame because the first function's in the middle of running when it calls the second one. Does that make sense? If you look at has solution, has solution called has solution in the middle of running in has solution. So the, we need to keep track of the outer one and we also need to keep track of the inner one. So it needs a new frame, not just a frame for every function, a frame for every time the function's called. So now you're thinking, oh, that's a lot of memory. Oh no, what a mess. So the way that people solve this is very, very clever. And this is more or less universally the way that people do function calls. In fact, it's so universally used that a lot of modern chips have built into the instruction set ways of doing this automatically with just one or two instructions to save doing any work. And here's the idea. We have something called a stack. Now let me tell you what a stack is in real life. If you've got a stack of pancakes, uh, who likes pancakes? How can you not like pancakes? Waffles. What? What? What's this? There's, there's waffles somewhere and we're missing the waffles. Oh man, that's outrageous. How could they be doing that? That's so unfair. <laughs> I'm sorry that you missed out on the waffles. We, we should have a class excursion up there. Does someone want to run up there and buy a whole lot of waffles and then come back here and share them out? Okay, look, we'll, we'll have our own course waffles, okay? We'll work out a way of doing it. We won't miss out. We'll do, oh, let me think about that. Okay. <laughs> it's like a mask bar. Now, here's how we go. Suppose we've got a stack of delicious waffles. And they're really yummy. And I know whenever you make waffles, you bring out more. And everyone's sitting around the table. No one ever saves any for the cook. And you bring out more. And I've made a new waffle. All right, here's my stack of waffles. Where am I going to put the waffle I've just made? On the top. And then I bring out another waffle. Where am I going to put it? On the top. <laughs> now, you've, you want a waffle. Where do you get it from? It means you get the yummy, warmest, nicest one. So you get it from the top. And then you want one, and you get it from the top, and you want one, and you get it from the top. And then I come out with another waffle. And I put it on the top. And we keep doing that for a while. When eventually we get to the bottom waffle, what's it like? Oh. It's cold and soggy. Why is that? Because it's the first one put on, and it's the last one taken off. This is what we call a stack, anything with this property, where you add new things at one end and then you take things off at the same end. Does that make sense? Stacks are very useful in computer science. I had a stack while I was driving here today in my car. I was driving along and the car in front of me had had a stack. It was crashed. So I didn't realize straight away. So I'm driving along and then boom, there's this car just stuck there and I'm stuck here. There's two lanes of traffic, but we're all traveling quite quick. And I'm, and I stop in front of this car. Now, of course, the car behind me stops, and the car behind him stops, and the car behind him stops, and we all put our indicator on. Let me out of here. But rom, 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 people are whizzing along here, waving at us and laughing. And we're stuck behind this car. And then there's a break in the traffic. Who gets out first? The guy at the back gets out. We all want to pull out, but uh, he's in the way. And then the gap's still there, so who gets out next? This guy, and then this guy, and then, oh, more cars come and I'm stuck there and the cars start piling up behind me again. I'm, <laughs> do you see? I'm stuck in a stack. Stacks happen all the time. The alternative to a stack is a queue. A queue is a model of, like, British fairness. A queue is first in, best rest. You know, first in, first out sort of thing. We like queues. Stacks are somehow anti-British, aren't they? They're, I don't know what they are. They're French. <laughs> okay. So... Here's what we're going to do. We're going to put all our frames in a stack. And we're going to have a new register called the stack pointer. And the stack pointer is going to point to the top of the stack. Initially, the stack is empty. So it's going to point to the bottom of memory. And then a function is called. And the, a frame gets set up at the bottom of memory. And the stack pointer gets updated to point to the top of that. 
Does that make sense? And then a new function is called, and its frame is put there, and the stack is then put up to there. And then a new function is called from inside that, and then da da da. So let me just write it down here. We'll go A, B, C. I want you to see the calling sequence. There's function A. And in the middle of function A, it calls a B. So now function B starts up, and function A is frozen. And function B goes, does some stuff, and then calls function C. That's the end of function B. And function C, <laughs> I like the way you think. Uh, no, C just does some stuff, and then it returns. OK, so A is running, and it's frozen while B is going and its frame is down here, frozen, and B is running, and its frame set up there, and it, and it keeps going, and it's called C, and it's frozen, and it started there. Can we release any of these frames? No, because no, those functions haven't finished. Now C is running, and its frame's on the top. When C finishes, what can we do? We can put the stack pointer back down. We can pop it off the top of the stack. Because once the function's finished, we can throw away its memory. And notice pushing the stack pointer down, we still preserve all the functions that were called before C. Does that make sense? So their memory's still preserved. So with just one thing, one stack pointer, we set up this thing called a, a series of stack frames. Does that make complete sense to you? So all the frames you need, thank you, <laughs> all the frames you need are up, and this is why it's at the bottom of memory, because it just grows up and then down, and up and then down. And we only need one, one register to keep track of where the stack is. Now, why am I telling you all of this? Well, obviously, if you've got a recursive function, like has solution, and if I gave it a completely empty board, has solution calls itself 81 times till it finally finds a solution. So at the innermost time, the stack will be 81 frames high. Does that make sense? And then as each of them finishes and terminates and returns true, the stack will decrease. Now, why am I telling you about that? Well, the interesting thing to know about with stack frames is if you have a function that calls itself forever, like if A called B and B called C and C called A, and there was no way of getting out of this, what's eventually going to happen? The stack is going to fill up. And then you get an error called stack overflow. So if you ever get a message called stack overflow, it means you've, you've you called too many functions. Now to overflow the stack is normally physically impossible to do. It's so huge. So to overflow it means you've somehow got an infinite loop in there. Some, and it's a recursive infinite loop. It's a function calling a function. So write a function, write factorial yourself, and don't put the terminal case in and run it, and you should get a stack overflow message. What's that? Ask for factorial at max end. Ask for factorial at max end, and it might even flow uh, overflow without even an infinite loop. Yeah, I don't know how many function calls it can put in here, but it probably can't take too many. I mean, it'll take a lot, but I don't think it could do max int of them. Now, guys, there's another reason that I wanted you to know about stack frames. And the reason I wanted you to know about them right now is this. Let's suppose I'm inside my function, my function C. And immediately under me is function B. And function C is running, and the stack point is pointing to the top of function C. And what's inside the frame? Do you remember? We've got up the return address is normally in the middle. Below that is the variables passed in. We'll call them parameters. And above that is normally the, the variables used locally, the local variables used by the functions. C has a very annoying property with arrays. That when we have an array, C has no clue how big the array is. Have you guys seen this already? You pass an array into a function, C has no way of knowing how big that array is, unless you've defined how big it is and you've told the function somehow. You could easily set up an array that was five integers big and pass it into a function, and then tell the function to fill that array up with a thousand numbers. And that's completely legal, and C is just going to laugh while you do it. <laughs> now, what's going to happen? Well, my array is in here. Suppose it's here. It's taking up this little bit of memory. And it's big enough to store five numbers. And I start pumping 1,000 numbers into it. What's going to happen? It's going to overflow it. It's going to fill up all this area, then it's going to fill up all this area. And, it's going to and what's it eventually going to overwrite? The next variable, and then it's going to overwrite the return address, and then it's going to overwrite the parameters, and it could even overflow into B stack frame if you were cool enough. Now, what's the interesting thing happening here? Who, who I mean, some of you know. What, what, of all those things I just said, what's the most interesting thing? The return address. The return address. It has overwritten the return address. If you pump too much data into your array, you will put garbage in the return address. So when your function terminates, where will it jump? Anywhere. Anywhere. 
and it'll probably jump to the wrong segment of memory and you'll probably get something called a seg fault. But what if, what if you didn't fill it with junk? What if you didn't fill it with junk? What if you filled it, the array knowing full well you're going to overwrite the return address and you overwrite the return address with a real address in memory of a really interesting place to go like the program that gives people super user powers or the program that deletes the entire hard disk. What's that? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> this is called an exploit. This is where most vulnerabilities occur. When you, get your, when you start up Microsoft Internet Explorer <laughs> and you get your traditional, oh, we've just found a security bug in Internet Explorer that means that anyone using Internet Explorer visiting any website could be taken over and their machine could be compromised. Here's the patch for it. What they're saying is, we have discovered inside Internet Explorer, what they're probably saying is, we've discovered inside Internet Explorer an area where we pass an array into a function and we forget to check how big the array is. And we allow the user to pump whatever they want into the array and we're sorry. <laughs> because the user could choose to pump into the array a whole lot of malicious stuff including a nasty return address. And that nasty return address, when, you're, when the function that Internet Explorer is currently using finishes, will cause Internet Explorer to jump and do whatever the nasty person wants them to do, if they're clever enough. That is called a stack overflow vulnerability. In C, when you guys write C programs, except for next week's lab where we'll actually write some stack overflow vulnerabilities, I never ever want you guys to pump data into an array without checking that you're not overflowing the array. Now if Microsoft coders actually did this, then whenever you turned on Microsoft you wouldn't have to wait six hours while it downloads patches because everything would just work and we'd all be very happy. So I think this is a very important thing to learn in your first year programming course. We know what causes stack overflows. There is no excuse for having stack overflows. Windows has lots of stack overflows. <laughs> I don't know how to join those three sentences together. You guys will never write a stack overflow. Next week's lab, we'll show you how to do it and we'll have fun actually overflowing a bit and doing some naughty stuff. And then, from then on, if anyone ever writes any code where there is potential for stack overflow, is an automatic five mark deduction from your marks for this course. In the exam, you can be sure there will be at least one question I put in there, solely hoping that someone will put a stack overflow in. I'll write a function, it won't look like a stack overflow function, it'll look like a real function. And I'll say, oh, could you just write a function so that the user could type some data in, maybe their name? And could you just store it in an array? <laughs> and, and maybe I'll make it look like it's about something else. I'll say, and then print out the name backwards, I'll say. And you'll think, oh, it's a function to print something out backwards. I know how to do that with recursion. It's not. It's a function to see if you're going to let the user type whatever they bloody well want and you're going to store it in the array, or if you're going to check that they don't type more than 50 characters in because your array is 50 characters big. And if you don't check they're not typing more than 50 characters in, and you store them in an array that you've defined to be 50 characters big, you've done a stack overflow vulnerability. pa -ching! And all around the room is where Mark and people start bursting into laughter and lights go off and we're happy. <laughs> and we write you out a letter of recommendation to Microsoft. <laughs> okay, so. So this is, now we'll start fooling around with setting up stack frames and you'll suddenly discover, the fr discover that frames are so much more fun and interesting than they used to be. Now we've got a real stack controlling them, you can do interesting things with them. Yes, your question. Why couldn't you just, um, you know, so rather than putting in variables and making it grow towards B, why not just make it grow up? Oh, well you can't make it grow up. This is a delightful thing about Intel. The stack normally grows down. If you store something in location one, you, you've got an array, okay? You say, store something in location one in the array. It puts it here. You say, all right, store something in location two. Well, C just goes, okay, that's the next address. That's here. I'll oh, store something in location three. That's the next address. That's here. So by overflowing, it always overflows down. And we are so happy and thankful that Intel machines are set up so the return address is below the variables. <laughs> if only it went the other way, life would be so much safer. D does that make sense? It's like saying, I don't know, uh, we're having a party, we're on the Blue Mountains, we're next to the cliff. <laughs> and every time someone new comes to the party, we push everyone one step closer to the edge of the cliff. <laughs> we could have decided every time someone comes, we push them one step away from the cliff, 
and we're always a constant difference from the cliff, but no, we do it the other way. That one design decision, which seemed brilliant at the time, <laughs> is actually responsible for a lot of bad things. Now, there are other ways of doing attacks. One of them I did myself earlier on in the course. Uh, I think it was Slavko pointed it out. Do we get bonus marks for releasing viruses? <laughs> no, no, no. If you write a virus or do a virus, you, you lose marks. You'd be, you'd be expelled from the uni. You'd be arrested by the police. It's illegal. We don't want you to do bad things. We just want you to know about bad things so you can stop them happening. No. <laughs> Quite seriously, you cannot stop bad things happening unless you know what the bad things are. But doing the bad things is unexcusable. Like, what if your piece of code that you think is so funny, or your virus you think is so clever, infects a machine that's doing an operation on someone? In America recently, there was a hospital that was brought down because of a virus. It's just insane that you, you, you have no idea what the implications of what you do. You think things are funny and clever. I used to do things that I would think were funny and clever. Yeah, you've got, you guys are on the curve of death. I showed you that before. Okay? Okay. You don't think about consequences. But the consequences could be far beyond what you think they could be. It could involve uh, someone's loss of life, someone's loss of job. It could involve a power plant shutdown. It could involve Three Mile Island. It could involve Chernobyl. It could involve any of those things. So you just don't monkey around with other people's stuff. It's rude. Monkey around with your own stuff. I've got a little mini internet set up at home. I attack my own machines. It's lots of fun. But... <laughs> Don't do any more than that. Because not only is it, I mean, it's illegal, but uh, that's not compelling. I'm trying to make eye contact with you. I've lost you. Right. Yeah. It's illegal, but I know. Who cares? Okay. That's the law. The law is sometimes good, sometimes stupid. Worse than that, I just think it's not decent to other people to treat people in that way. Yes? Is it not equally the responsibility of the person writing a program for a mission critical uh, task to put these protections into their code as it is for the people? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's absolutely everyone's responsibility. If you write mission critical code, it's your responsibility to get it right. But you won't get it right. I mean, we know in the security game, to get a piece of code right, you can't have a single problem in it. Every single problem has to be fixed. To attack a piece of code, you've just got to find one problem. It's an asymmetric uh, situation. So, yeah, you can, you can fix nine million problems and forget one. This guy's just got to find that one. So, yeah. And how many mission critical things? I went into my bank the other day. And I was lining up, and it was going really slowly. And I eventually got to the teller, and she said, sorry, I can't do any transactions on my machine. It's frozen. And I said, just a flash came to me, because you can never see their machines. I said, Is it, you're not running Windows, are you? And she said, yeah, yeah, XP. And I said, oh, the bank's software is running Windows. He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, oh, OK. Can I have all my money back? <laughs> You know, so people do, in mission-critical places, install software. I mean, software is all about trust. You have to trust that Microsoft will do the right thing. You have to trust the people that make your cables do the right You have to trust everyone along the way. The bank, it's about how cheaply well, yeah, OK. Let's, let's not be sceptical about banks. Banks are wonderful things. We don't want to make fun of Who's banks. Bank? Yeah, Who's my bank? <laughs> I'll just write my account number up here. <laughs> OK, all right, now we're going to take a little break. Uh, I want everyone to stretch and move around and get the blood pumping. After the break, we will return. I'll just talk a little bit about task two officially. Then we'll have another break, which is a real break, and then we'll do the extension Q&A about task two. Yeah. With task two. 